It's four o'clock in Radio Cairo. This is World of Info. Well, it's a hot afternoon in Radio Cairo, and today is uh, uh, the the twenty first of, of May, and we are having uh, with us a very distinguished guest. Uh, His Excellency Dr. Peter Kivik, the ambassador of Hungary in Egypt, a very seasoned diplomat who served in China and has a PhD from Freiburg in Germany in international relations, but he has been serving here in Egypt for quite a long time and really we are uh, really blessed to have such an experienced ambassador in the embassy of his country here in Cairo. He is also the ambassador at large in uh, Chad and in uh, for his country in Chad, in Sudan and South Sudan and Eritrea. Uh, and of course, uh, you are more than welcome, sir, to come with us in these uh, in this hot weather in Cairo. <laughs> thank you very much for the warm welcome and thank you for inviting me here today. It's it's really a great pleasure. We had the pleasure of having His Excellency talking to us about Hungary and about Egyptian-Hungarian relations. But we are going to start our program today in a bit different way because we have to talk about the communist effect or the the communist uh, denominator, uh, uh, the communist factor in all our discussions, in our talks with everyone, and that is the coronavirus. Every country in the world has its policy towards corona. Every country of the world, almost every country in the world, is having victims from corona people who uh, lost their loved ones and people who suffered from corona and people who are infected from corona and therefore we have to share experiences we're going to talk about the corona effect in hungary and uh, the corona effect in egypt of course and egyptian hungarian relations so let's start about hungary i mean hungary was surprised uh, to find the swarming uh, virus coming uh, in the world and Hungary had uh, very uh, strong decisions to make and very early incisions to be made by the Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Victor Urban. Tell us about this and how you uh, tried to act very swiftly from the very moment you noticed uh, infections of the corona. Hungary was one of the first countries in Europe to take the uh, very tough measures. Uh, we closed the borders uh, mid-March, on the 16th of March. Uh, we uh, uh, introduced very uh, uh, strict, uh, I wouldn't say lockdown, but it, is, it, it was almost a, a, a lockdown. And uh, schools were closed uh, at a very early stage, as I said. So this is the reason why I think we uh, managed to uh, stop the uh, explosion of the, uh, of the virus uh, relatively successfully. We have had until now uh, a little bit more than uh, 3,000 cases until now, which is, I think, uh, not, a, not a very big number uh, according to what we witnessed uh, in Europe, in other countries of Europe. But uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, death rate has been unfortunately uh, high, uh, much, much higher than, for example, in Egypt. Uh, it's above uh, 10%. I think this is because uh, we have a, a relatively aged uh, population, a high group of uh, a big a big group of uh, elderly people in the society, and they are of course uh, more vulnerable to the vi virus. Uh, the population others. of Hungary is almost now, uh, with the last census, eleven or, or uh, nine. We are around a little bit less than ten million. Ten, uh, nine, nine, nine and something. Right? Yes, yes, oh, nine million. Uh, around around uh, ten million. Uh, of course, uh, even one loss of life is uh, is too much, but uh, I can um, tell you that um, due to these uh, measures that the government took, uh, we managed to uh, control the virus uh, at a relatively uh, uh, low mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. But uh, but the measures are really is costing the economy so much, and how the people perceived the ac the action of the government by. Uh, the complete almost complete shutdown people are allowed to go to the work but uh, they have to do it uh, very cautiously and people if they go downstairs to the streets they have to have a reasonable reason for going they're not just going on promenades and this is maintained by the police force and the and the military as well that's right uh, the hungarian police and the hungarian army played a, a very important role in uh, in the fight against virus uh, streets were controlled by uh, uh, 
uh, by the police uh, forces. Even hospitals uh, they were uh, controlled, uh, headed by uh, by police or uh, army officers. Of course, they didn't uh, interfere into uh, decisions of uh, of uh, doctors. They were just responsible to uh, make sure that the uh, supply chain of uh, healthcare devices and medical items uh, be sure. Mm -hmm. And it was very successful uh, like this because the uh, whole uh, healthcare system uh, managed to be uh, to, to function in a very efficient way. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why the uh, a uh, number of uh, new cases uh, is relatively uh, relatively low the society accepted the hungarian public opinion accepted uh, uh, these measures according to the uh, opinion polls i think uh, over 70% almost 80% of the hungarians agreed with the uh, uh, measures of the government regardless of whether they are pro or uh, against the government but uh, around 80% uh, of Hungarians uh, uh, have been supporting uh, the policies of the uh, government uh, in that regard. The government got a very uh, strong mandate uh, from the parliament uh, to do uh, these measures. We introduced, uh, as we call it, uh, an um, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, legal system or the we can say the government, the, the parliament gave an extraordinary power uh, to the government uh, just for the time of the uh, uh, corona crisis. Mm. And all these measures together uh, have proved to work uh, in a very efficient way. Uh, Hungary is a country that is known, besides, of course, the fact that it has uh, almost all the population are, work, are highly educated and they are uh, taking their share in high-tech industries, but also it's a tourist country. And uh, t uh, tourism is uh, one of the most important uh, incomes of, of the country or, or a lot of the population. So with the, with the closure or the shutdown of the borders, uh, Hungary is facing a crisis like all other countries in the, in the uh, sector of tourism. So what, are, what were the plans of the, of the government to face such a, a big hit to one of the resources of the country? The Hungarian government took uh, immediate measures to, uh, to support uh, those industries uh, who are uh, harshly affected by the uh, coronavirus, among them, of course, the uh, tourism. Uh, the uh, government decided uh, at a very early stage to uh, uh, exempt the, uh, uh, the hotels and uh, uh, tour operators, touristic companies, from uh, uh, paying uh, tax, uh, taxes and uh, all kind of uh, uh, allowances have been given to them mm -hmm. to, uh, to support their, uh, their survival, I mean to support the survival of the, uh, of the companies, of the, industry, yes. uh, of, the, of the industries. Hotels were encouraged to use this time for uh, renovating uh, uh, their premises and to make uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, new developments that uh, will make it easier to attract more guests when the uh, corona is over. So we have uh, been trying to use this time in, a, uh, in an efficient way. On the other hand, uh, uh, hotels and uh, tour operators were encouraged to, uh, to keep their, uh, their labor. Mm. Uh, the government uh, gave a suspension of um, many uh, kind of, of uh, duties and uh, and fees that uh, companies have to pay until uh, the end of the uh, end of this year or, or even further and what is uh, also very important for the uh, not only for the crisis ridden industries but all for all the economy that the government decided uh, mid march already to uh, suspend the repayment of all uh, all debts mm. Uh, so there is a moratorium on uh, debt repayments for uh, for companies and for uh, private persons, mm. at least at the end of this year. Mm. And regarding uh, and uh, depending on the situation, how it will be by the end of this year, it uh, will be decided and checked again uh, what is necessary. But uh, it is sure that uh, till the end of this year, no one has to pay any debt back in mm. Hungary. Mm. So the, the problem always with Corona is that what we were discussing before we went on air was the fear. The fear that the number will increase beyond our health care systems uh, capabilities. 
and there is no healthcare system that can really cope with uh, with a swarming of millions of people who are having this uh, disease. So uh, the, there is always a black scenario that every government has to put in mind. Uh, what should they do if there is another wave? Or what should they do if another uh, uh, the, there will be more huge numbers of people who are affected? God forbid that to happen. But always in policy making, these uh, these plans or, or plan B has to be put. So what what are what is the plan B for the Hungarian government? We are closing the borders. We are telling the people to not to go out except if uh, if it is extremely necessary. But if things get out of the control as regards the number, what are the plans? Do you plan to to build more field hospitals, military field hospitals? Or what, what, what would should you be your, your plan? We have built uh, field hospitals already, and the uh, Hungarian uh, army is, is uh, ready to uh, build more, uh, to provide the, uh, the population with more uh, field hospitals. Besides that, we uh, uh, bought uh, a really uh, big amount of all kind of uh, items that are necessary to fight corona, like uh, like medicine or masks or uh, protect, protective uh, uh, clothes, uh, respiratory machines uh, and so on. So uh, we, have, uh, we have a very good uh, amount of uh, stock of, mm. uh, of these items. Uh, besides that, uh, a group of Hungarian engineers managed uh, to develop uh, a new type of uh, ventilator. Mm. This, uh, this ventilator uh, is uh, in mass production already. Mm. Uh, it is a very state-of-the-art uh, item. It can be used for uh, the ventilation, for the artificial artificial uh, respiration of uh, up to five persons, mm. which is a big uh, big progress because uh, this is usually so usually one to one. Exactly. Mm. So this is the one machine can be used for uh, up to five persons. Mm. And uh, step by step, I mean, um, Hungarian uh, scientists are uh, working on the uh, on the vaccine, also on the on the medication. Uh, they are progressing, so we don't uh, think that this is a, the issue is over. Uh, maybe we are about winning the first battle, but uh, we expect that uh, other uh, other breakouts might come, and we are preparing ourselves for the for the next wave uh, mm. of the virus as you say we never expected that in our lifetimes to see what our uh, ancestors has seen in the years for example in the 14th century in the famous black plague which happened in 1340s up to 1350 when uh, it was swarmed i was telling uh, dr peter that egypt has lost almost half of its population in 1345-47 and he said to me, Europe have lost two thirds, right? Yes. So uh, uh, not, uh, we thought that we read that only in, in history books, but we are finding ourselves in such a situation. So we are still with His Excellency Ambassador, Dr. Peter Kivik, Ambassador of Hungary in Egypt, and we'll talk more about the coronavirus and about the measures to combat the coronavirus, but after the break. So we're still on air with Dr. Peter Kivik, Ambassador of Hungary in Egypt. Excellency, we're talking about uh, Corona and how the Hungary is trying to manage. And you were just telling us uh, before we went on air, uh, before we went off air, is about the ventilator, the Hungarian ventilator, which supports five patients instead of supporting one patient at a time. And uh, you even uh, were kind enough to share this information with the Egyptian health authorities, offering them with a very reasonable uh, price the the product and offering as much as Egypt might need. Hopefully, Egypt in the in the current state, uh, it's, we're not that much in, in need of all these equipment. Hopefully, things will not get worse than that. Uh, we are talking since we talked about the health measures and about the quarantine. We have to talk about uh, since you are uh, a reference in international relations. We have to talk about the economic uh, whiplash of of Corona. Uh, we see all the industries all over the world, uh, all the countries, all the economies are, are suffering, even the, the biggest economies in the world, talking about uh, the United States or China or Germany and France, we are seeing countries suffering uh, more and more even than the Great Depression of the 30s, which was man-made. I mean, the Great Depression of the 30s was man-made. It was made by mistakes 
done by some politicians and once it, these uh, bad decisions were reversed things got better but if all the even the optimists of today say if corona stops today we'll have 18 at least 18 months of recession until things get on so tell us about generally i mean in your prospect about about the economy economic whiplash I think uh, the world economy is really in a deep trouble. I think uh, what we are witnessing is it's, uh, it's a, a crisis that one can see maybe once in a century. Mm. The uh, important thing is not to focus on uh, on uh, uh, repairing the uh, effects mm. of the uh, of the uh, of the of the corona. But nevertheless, we can uh, draw some key conclusions mm. from uh, what we have seen so far. I think uh, the role of the national state will increase because everybody could see that uh, governments, it is, it is, these are governments who, if they make the, the right decisions, can uh, control uh, uh, the, the corona. Mm. And uh, again, it is. Uh, I think it's 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 in the hand uh, of the governments to uh, uh, to take uh, the right decisions uh, to lead the uh, uh, economies and uh, the enterprises uh, to the right direction. It is uh, it is very clear that uh, we need um, the world economy will have a different system after the corona mm. than uh, what we had before. In my expectation, it will take, um, as you said, uh, maybe a year or two or one and a half uh, to uh, recover. But uh, we must focus on uh, on essential things. We must focus uh, on uh, security issues, and I mean, uh, I mean, health uh, security. Uh, the safety of the population uh, is on the first place uh, uh, everywhere, and. Uh, I think uh, the new decisions uh, must be based, must uh, must focus uh, first of all to uh, maintain uh, uh, the uh, health care, the security of the healthcare system in uh, each and every, every country. Maybe we will have to invest more in this. Maybe we will have to invest more into uh, preventive measures. Mm. To invest more in uh, <clears throat> strengthen, strengthening uh, the research uh, capacities, to strengthening the uh, uh, well-being uh, of the uh, population uh, in, uh, in general. If you have a, a strong and healthy population with a strong immune system, uh, it will be much more uh, resistant to uh, any kind of viruses and uh, not only uh, resistant to the viruses but also uh, it will be able to bring uh, more achievement uh, uh, in the in, in in the work so it will benefit the uh, the whole uh, economy all in all i think um, as a result uh, the role uh, of governments the role of national states uh, will be much more important after the corona than before and uh, the main uh, issue is uh, to take uh, the right decisions for the governments. So when we're talking about that, we, you, are frame, you are of course familiar, there was an Egyptian joke, should I close the door or keep it open? And so one of the guys uh, responding in this comic play said, just keep, keep it slightly open. So, so when we're talking about that, the complete shutdown versus the complete opening or slightly open. This is the, the, the problem that every country in the world is facing nowadays. Countries like uh, France and Spain said that we have taken the blow and we are trying now to gradually open. A country like uh, Greece that was not affected majorly by this stuff started opening its uh, beaches and started opening up even for tourism from Europe, uh, from European uh, uh, council, not uh, of course uh, from the rest of the world, and so countries are facing this problem. Should we open the door? Should we keep it slightly open, slightly closed? Should we complete, continue with the policy of shutdown? We've seen uh, Trump uh, saying that we have to open the economy, otherwise we're going to uh, people will die, will starve to death instead of die from from the infection. So, what uh, what what do you think should be done? 
We're talking globally, of course. We're not talking about any special nations. Yes. I know that you're a diplomat. We're just saying uh, on the on the th on theory. I mean, well, I can tell you what we are doing in Hungary. Mm. Uh, we have, uh, thanks God, uh, decreasing numbers. Uh, I cannot tell you that uh, Corona disappeared. It's, mm. We still have some uh, some new cases, but it is uh, significantly less than what we had uh, a couple of weeks ago. We started a very uh, cautious opening. We consider it. We consider every opening steps uh, many times before doing it, mm. because the global environment is not safe yet mm. in terms of of, uh, of Corona. We have just uh, seen yesterday WHO reported the highest ever uh, uh, growth rate of new uh, uh, cases yesterday. Mm. We have never seen that many new cases uh, since the uh, uh, beginning of the crisis like yesterday. So uh, I would warn anyone to think that, uh, that the, the, the crisis is over. That's why our government uh, in Hungary is 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 doing a policy of uh, very cautious very mm. cautious opening uh like uh some public areas uh, are open now uh, we uh, we are considering uh, a partial opening of the of the schools uh, and um things like that but uh we uh, we are saying that uh, it is still uh, it is still going on as we see, as we saw it uh, in some other countries, a new breakout can come at any time. Yes. So we have to uh, to stay prepared. I think it is it is much better to uh, consider the opening steps uh, carefully than uh, being forced uh, to go back or to lose everything what we uh, won through the efforts of the last uh, uh, couple of weeks uh, or months. Mm. So we're going to leave the door slightly open. <laughs> we, uh, we have to, we have, we we have have to, to do, do this, that, yes. and we have to monitor the situation very carefully, not only uh, in our country, but also uh, worldwide. That's what we are doing. Uh, we see that uh, we have uh, encouraging figures uh, in some European countries, but we see uh, strongly increasing uh, figures in other parts of the world. So I think uh, it is... Uh, it, 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 it's... Uh, not the right time to to think that the crisis is over mm -hmm. yes uh, unfortunately this is right even in the uh, on the words of the even the the best op uh, optimistic people in the world they still are very cautious so after the break we have to talk about the egyptian hungarian relations with the great improvement that happened recently. So, with Dr. Peter Kevik, the Ambassador of Hungary in Egypt, stay tuned with us in this beautiful afternoon in the world of info from Radio Cairo. So, we're still with His Excellency Dr. Peter Kevik, Ambassador of Hungary in Egypt, and we are talking about the subject of cooperation, economic cooperation between Egypt and Hungary. And we had uh, recently, uh, Egypt has signed uh, an agreement uh, of, uh, of uh, helping in selling and manufacturing as well uh, cars for or wagons for the trains. Tell us about that because the famous Egyptian uh, Hungarian or the Magari train has been always uh, part of the Egyptian history, especially in the 60s and the 70s. And we had the famous uh, player, the Egyptian player Mustafa Abdu. He was fast. He was, uh, uh, people had a lot of confidence in him and people consider him to be a good scorer, so they gave him the name of Magari, which stands that it's a trustworthy uh, wagoneer, or a trustworthy uh, locomotives and trains, and fast. So Magari, or Mustafa Abdu, was trustworthy and fast, that's why he got the nickname of Magari, right? So tell us about the Magari, or the new Magari uh, train cars that are going to run in the tra railways of Egypt very soon. Well, the excellent uh, news is that uh, the deal is done. We signed all the uh, all the agreements, the commercial contract, the financial contract. Uh, it entered into forces uh, uh, recently, and um, the uh, first uh, trains are coming uh, to Egypt very soon. I think in, uh, at the end of June, we will see the, uh, the first uh, group of new wagons mm. uh, uh, coming uh, coming to Egypt in uh, um, Hungarian-Russian cooperation. So mm. uh, this time it will be uh, a Magari, or we can say Magari Rusi, <laughs> yes. in um, in this field. But uh, I think it's a very, it's it uh, this cooperation has a model value mm. because three friendly countries uh, like uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Russia, and Hungary. 
uh, if they uh, join forces uh, together, we can uh, bring back the glory of the old days of the uh, of the time when um, we were uh, pioneers of uh, state of the art uh, railway systems in Egypt. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it will add a lot to the uh, uh, safety and security on uh, Egyptian railways because uh, uh, these wagons, these coaches uh, have uh, an excellent design, the uh, very comfortable uh, according to up to the uh, highest standards. I think it, they will contribute uh, to the modernization of the Egyptian transportation system uh, to a large extent. I see this uh, this project uh, as a as a model for further uh, similar projects uh, like this. Uh, we can uh, we can think about uh, continuing this uh, this cooperation between uh, Egypt, Hungary, and Russia uh, in this field. And uh, I, I I think it is a golden opportunity for our uh, our countries, for these uh, three countries, to open a new chapter in their uh, industrial cooperation. I'm pretty much com uh, convinced that um, uh, industries uh, will have uh, an increasing role in the uh, in the future. Some people uh, speak sometimes about uh, post-industrial uh, societies. I don't think that, uh, that the time of, of uh, industries are over. We have seen uh, in the financial crisis of 2008-2009 that uh, we cannot uh, build uh, an economic system on uh, on services only or on, on uh, financial interactions uh, Real only. Estate, uh. Uh, we need uh, industries, uh, producing industries, because we have seen at that the time that those countries were more resistant uh, to the crisis mm. who uh, were uh, able to maintain uh, their industries. That was uh, one of the reasons why, for example, the government of Hungary started a re-industrialization of the country in 2010. Mm -hmm. it, and it was uh, successful. I think uh, producing these, uh, uh, these wagons uh, together, uh, jointly in cooperation, will uh, be uh, a big an important added value uh, to the economic system of all the three countries. Mm. It will uh, make our uh, industries stronger in a very important, very strategic field, uh, in the field of uh, transportation and railways, and it can show us the way to uh, other similar projects together. When you are talking about Hungary in this particular, since you have raised the point, we are going to remind our listeners of what we have said always about Hungary, about a country that has really uh, suffered in the century of suffering. I believe the 20th century was a century of suffering for Hungary, especially in the first half of it, when there was the First World War, when Hungary lost almost 40%, 50% of the population, almost 40% of its territories and uh, after the defeat of the World War One, and of course in World War Two, where it was involved on the wrong side unfortunately because it was the only way at that time and then the uh, being uh, attacked by the Germans in the end of the war and then by the Russians in the uh, final uh, days of the war with the loss of liberty and loss of democracy and its uh, ill-fated unfortunately revolution of 1956 but there always remain uh, the resilience of the Hungarian people. I find that the Hungarians, have, although they have suffered, they were able always to rise like a phoenix uh, from the ashes when they started uh, having becoming very much highly educated. And so there were there in the 1990, uh, there was a very fertile land for uh, the uh, the computer industries and the minor industries. You brought up a subject that is different than what we have discussed always every time, because from 1990 till 2010, there were a lot of Hungarians who were involved in the high-tech industries, in the, in the R&D of uh, famous companies. Uh, headquarters, European headquarters of big companies have chosen to go to Hungary because this is the, the place where there is a very well-educated population that can act as really a good uh, ground builders for, for these industries like Google or other industries or places like that. But going back to the heavy industries of the 40s and the 50s, this is not going back as much as it is 
uh, rediscovering? Well, uh, I think uh, it's always important uh, to keep a right balance, mm. also in the uh, in the economy. Uh, as I told you, uh, we saw that uh, over uh, liberalizing uh, the economies turned uh, to be a failure mm. in uh, the world economic and financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Uh, producing industries uh, are very important uh, to be maintained. And I think uh, after, uh, after the uh, corona crisis, uh, we will see uh, the re-emergence of uh, such um, economic philosophies that we thought uh, they belong uh, to the past. Mm. For the simple reason that uh, the last uh, period of time showed that uh, we have to be pre prepared uh, to crisis situations. We have to be prepared that uh, uh, borders are not always so uh, invisible or easy to cross as uh, they were before. So I think uh, in Hungary we made uh, this experience also after the uh, the change of uh, uh, systems in the late 80s, early 90s, in uh, exactly 30 years ago. Uh, the governments uh, at that time uh, focused uh, always on the moderniza modernization of the uh, uh, economy. I think uh, we achieved uh, a good progress in that uh, because uh, if you compare the uh, industrial, the economic structure of Hungary at that time, 30 years ago, and uh, what we have now, the productivity went up uh, to a large extent. The uh, modernization of the uh, economy uh, has been uh, extremely successful. Uh, we reached the level of full employment. So at the time of uh, when uh, Corona arrived in um, Hungary in uh, March, early March, we had basically a full employment. Everyone who had uh, uh, the desire to work um, could find work very easily. Quite the contrary, companies started having um, difficulties in hiring new uh, 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 labor. I think uh, our luck was that the uh, corona crisis found the Hungarian economy in a very, very good shape. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we have a very good chance in Hungary to have a so-called, what they uh, call a, a V-shaped uh, mm. curve, V-shaped uh, crisis curve. That means uh, after a sharp uh, decline, decline, we will have hopefully a, a sharp uh, increase, uh, upswing. Uh, the program, uh, the goal of the Hungarian government is uh, to... Um, create all jo uh, those jobs again within a very short period of time that were lost uh, because of the corona. It will be uh, a very uh, diff difficult task, but uh, I'm sure that uh, if we uh, maintain the national unity, the strong support to this program like what we are having now, we will be successful. Mm. So when we're talking about the, going back to the wagoners, the wagons, uh, how many wagons are there coming from Hungary and, and Russia? We are talking about all together about uh, 1,300 wagons, mm -hmm. and uh, this is this is shared 50-50 between uh, uh, Russia and Hungary. Mm -hmm. And they are not only third class, second class, but also first class as well, right? All kind of all kind of wagons. Uh, we will deliver exactly what the Egyptian National Railways ask us uh, mm. to deliver: first class, second class, third class, uh, even. Uh, um, uh, sleeping wagons and buffet wagons, uh, mm. everything what uh, <clears throat> what you can imagine. So you will see them very soon on uh, Egyptian uh, railways. Mm. The first uh, delivery will arrive in uh, in Egypt, I think, in the last uh, days, last week of uh, June. So roughly in a month's time. And uh, how long will it take to deliver all of them? I think we are talking about forty months. Mm. That's almost uh, four year, uh, four years, right? Three years and a three, half. Three and a half years, mm -hmm. about yes, mm -hmm. for the for the one thousand three hundred. And for the return of the Hungarians on the on the on the roads. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Since we are talking about Hungary and Hungarian Egyptian cooperation, I think there are other fields of cooperation between Egypt and Hungary besides that. Can you tell us also about that, please? 
Well, after the after the um, economic and um, industrial cooperation, I would like to focus on uh, investing in human capital mm. because this is the key to uh, the success of every country. I'm uh, very proud to tell you that we have a very well functioning scholarship program mm. uh, with Egypt. Since uh, 2015, the Hungarian government has been uh, offering <clears throat> 100 scholarships per year to Egyptian students at all uh, kind of uh, educational level, BA, MA, PhD, in whatever field uh, they like, and it is working very well. Our experience is that uh, Egyptian students uh, prefer fields like uh, uh, technical education, technical uh, uh, universities, uh, agriculture, uh, medicine, and so on. We, so we have a good variety of uh, uh, of, uh, of fields, and uh, we are convinced that uh, these young people will uh, play a very important role in uh, shaping the future of our uh, our economic cooperation. That's why we are ready, and we are glad to invest in them, in the hope that uh, with their help we will further increase our cooperation. This is a reviving of what happened in the early 70s and late 60s when there were a lot of scholarships of uh, of post uh, postgraduate studies were made in Hungary at that time, right? That is right. In the fields of medicine in the 19 uh, in the 1960s, uh, 70s, 80s uh, we had uh, exactly uh, 600 Egyptian students mm -hmm. graduated from Hungary. 600 mm -hmm. The program start. The current program started in 2015. We are in the. That means we are in the fifth year already. And you have already 500. Almost reached. Uh, we 500. have almost reached uh, that level in five years. What uh, what we had in uh, in 25, 30 years earlier. Mm -hmm. So this shows how uh, fast our um, cooperation is developing, how uh, committed our uh, governments uh, mm -hmm. are to. Uh, bring uh, our countries closer together. Since we are uh, talking with the ambassador of Hungary, we have to talk about eminent Hungarians in Egypt. And uh, we cannot leave this every time we bring the subject, but definitely the subject brings a lot of uh, uh, good memories and uh, good stories to the Egyptians. Let's talk about Max Hertz as a start. The, the famous uh, architect, uh, the uh, the archaeologist, the architect, the one who built uh, Rafai Mosque and the one who was responsible for the renovations made in the Oriental Islamic uh, monuments in, in Egypt back in the early 19th, early 20th century, I think he still has a, a has a place in the heart of the Egyptian-Hungarian relations, right, more or less. That is absolutely right. Mm. Uh, when you walk around Cairo, you can find um, the, the traces and the uh, the buildings of uh, Max Hertz everywhere. The Rafael Mosque and the Islamic not, Museum. Not only, not only this, but uh, if you go to the Tahrir, you see the uh, uh, former headquarters of the American University mm. uh, yes. in Cairo. This is also a, a building uh, designed by Max Hertz. Exactly, yes. And many other, ma 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 many mm. mosques, mm. Uh, many other public buildings. We are really proud of this because it, it shows how uh, closely uh, connected our countries are, how uh, good the cooperation uh, has been for a very long time. And of course, we have to mention, since we're talking about uh, romanticism as well, we'll talk about Al Kant Al Mashi, or as he is quite f famously known in Egypt by Al Maza. <laughs> and Al Maza, or, or the famous airbase Al Maza, uh, the Egyptian military airbase or the airport Al Maza, is named under the name of uh, Count Al Mashi, who was a great explorer and an aviator and uh, a writer. I mean, this man was uh, a full-rounded uh, Renaissance man, right? Yes, we can fully say this. His other nickname was, besides Al Maza, uh, was Abu Ramla. Really? Because yeah. he was like in love with the, with the desert. Mm -hmm. He um, explored many places. Uh, in uh, in Egypt, he uh, he drew maps about the desert, uh, the Western desert that were not uh, mm. uh, uh, discovered by modern cartographs uh, at that time. He uh, discovered uh, the famous uh, cave of swimmers mm. in the southwestern part of uh, of Egypt, in the Gif Kabir, mm. in the uh, um, Kabir Mountains. Mm. Uh, which is a very interesting thing because uh, it, in the middle of the desert uh, he found uh, prehistoric paintings on the wall of a cave showing uh, people swimming. Mm. That means that um, 30, 40,000 years ago when those paintings were uh, created, mm. the landscape must have been completely different. Of course. Uh, 
So uh, I think he's uh, he's someone who added a lot uh, mm. to the uh, to the friendship between our. And countries. he inspired the the novel uh, English Patient, and of course the film that everybody has seen and was very much involved, although it has partial truth and partial myth in it of course it's not <laughs> that, that is, true because that is absolutely right. because uh, count almashi survived uh, the world war 2 and he uh, unfortunately uh, was uh, tried under the the communist regime in the late uh, 40s suffered a lot of brutality and afterwards went to austria where he died uh, in a very young age uh, compared compared with his contemporaries but still his name is carrying on the famous uh, uh, airport in 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 Heliopolis, right? Mm. And the yes. famous uh, all the <laughs> sector near that is not always known as Almaza, so yes. it's not just the airport. <laughs> so uh, one of the suburbs of Cairo is called Almaza under the name of Almashi, the famous. Uh, count. We can say that yes. yes. <laughs> and we have to remind our uh, listeners with famous Hidikoti <laughs> and Bushkash. And Bushkash. Yes. <laughs> everybody, I think, whatever uh, everybody, whatever they see, uh, you know, they know that you are the uh, Hungarian best always they start asking you about Hidikoti and Boschkash, right? That is true and that makes me very proud. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because Hidikoti uh, was a great success for the Hungarian team in the 50s, but his great success was serving the national team, Al Ahli, one of the most popular teams in Egypt, with all due respect to Zamalek fans, but Ahli is the <laughs> majority. <laughs> And, mm -hmm. and Hidikuti was the, the best scorer as regards the number of championships he was able to get to the, to the club, right? Yes, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> and Boschkish remains in the hearts of Hungarians. Let's talk about Boschkish because he finished part of his life here in Egypt, but he was a great uh, uh, li liberal man, a man who was anti-communist, a man who was a supporter right. Right. to the revolution of 1956. Right. And on the personal level, he suffered because he was not very much welcome after the revolution. They couldn't put him to jail. They couldn't uh, uh, sentence him to death they, like they've sentenced uh, uh, Najee. But he was a man who suffered and yet fought for, liber for liberty. True. I think his We life have to give him mention, please. Yes, absolutely. I think his life uh, reflects um, or shows uh, the whole course of Hungarian history of the, mm. of the 20th century. His life, if you look at his life, the, we can get a uh, very uh, precise picture of how uh, Hungary um, was suffering uh, in the in the in the twentieth um, uh, century, but his example uh, is a very encouraging one also. Mm. I mean, he played in 1954, and he was very famous. He That's represented. Right. The, he he led the Hungarian team to the semi-finals or something like that, yes. right? Yes, that is true. But his example uh, is also very encouraging to that extent that uh, uh, he did everything. Uh, from his own uh, efforts mm. uh, he was uh, very uh, um, very courageous and uh, he uh, he focused uh, he was able to focus on uh, on how to do things better how to uh, um, get uh, things done uh, better every time and this uh, is encouraging uh, for all of us i think uh, his example is uh, is encouraging all the all the hungarians this is the uh, this is a reason also why uh, our national stadium uh, is carrying his name it mm -hmm. is named it's it's uh, Pushkash stadium mm -hmm. uh, as we call it it's a very uh, beautiful very uh, very modern uh, uh, sports uh, uh, complex in budapest and he's 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 in our heart uh, he's uh, he's a part of the hungarian identity actually mm -hmm. and he's part of also the the history of football in egypt and especially when he led the team of Al Masri in in Port Said, uh, where he was the head coach, right? Yes. And uh, he earned some championship and got very good high-ranking places under his auspice as the main uh, head coach of Al Masri. So I think all the Port Said. Uh, uh, people are really fond of him, right? <laughs> yes, that is true. <laughs> You've been to Porsaid and you have seen some uh, Porsaid natives talking about Pushkish? Of course, I have uh, I have visited uh, basically all uh, corners of, uh, <laughs> of Egypt, except for the Gif Kabir. I've m I haven't managed so, to get there yet, so you've but been Porsaid and the other uh, places. You've, you've been, of course, to Al Maza Air Base, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Part of your it's job to be... It's a <laughs> must. You've seen, uh, you've, you've seen Al Maza Airport, and I think you should uh, give them a, one of the 
portraits of uh, Count al Mashi as a gift. Uh -huh. I think this would uh, they would take it very seriously to put it in one of their sure. uh, coming talking about the portraits of Count al Mashi. Mm. Believe it or not, when I went to the Siva Oasis. Mm. Uh, in a hotel when they heard that I'm from Hungary they showed me immediately a beautiful uh, oil painting uh, mm. showing uh, Laszlo Almasi. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Yes. And one of his uh, uh, relatives is working now in Egypt, right? More yes, or less. That yes, that is true. That is <laughs> and true. Scanning... It, seems, it seems that the family is uh, um, uh, following mm. the uh, steps of uh, uh, Laszlo Almasi, because he's uh, one of his uh, late relatives, uh, Miklós, is, mm. uh, has been working here in, yes. uh, as an engineer. <laughs> and he's interested in history, you said, and he's uh, very Absolutely. much interested in history of his, yes. of his family. So, sir, when we are talking about the future, a lot of people are talking about future with extreme pessimism under the corona. I know you've been always, I mean, we've known each other for the past 12 years or so, and you've been always on the optimistic side. So... Let's give some hope to our listeners. Well, how do you see the future, especially with the wordings that mostly we are going to find a vaccine? Don't you think so? Yes, sooner or later, I'm sure we, uh, we will find a vaccine. Until then, uh, we have to be very cautious, but uh, we cannot uh, afford uh, the luxury of not being uh, optimistic. Mm. We, have to, uh, we have to draw the conclusions uh, of the past and we have to look uh, into the future with, with uh, more confidence. Let's uh, see uh, a chance in this experience that we gained uh, from the corona. Let's, uh, it gives us the also opportunity to, to do things better than uh, what we did before. I think uh, if we join forces uh, within the societies and uh, uh, in the international uh, uh, field as well, also our two countries, uh, Egypt and Hungary, mm. uh, we will manage to build a much better world, a much better after Corona world mm. than what we had before. Yes, I think it will be more uh, a kinder world. And I think it's going to uh, people who, uh, even rich people and people who are in power, found themselves weak. And this is usually uh, times for meditation and people will really understand that uh, sometimes a very uh, microscopic or electromicroscopic structure can really turn our lives around. So the vulnerability of the human beings and the surviving of human beings depend on cooperation, not on animosity. That's right. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Sir Excellen Excellency Dr. Peter Kivik, it's always lovely to have you with us on Radio Cairo. And we, it was very kind of you to share today your wisdom and the experience of your uh, distinguished government in dealing with the coronavirus and the will of cooperation between Egypt and uh, Hungary is here to stay for many years to come. Thank you very much indeed uh, for the kind invitation and uh, let me express my sincere wish best wishes and congratulations on, uh, on the uh, uh, aid hmm. uh, feast which we are uh, approaching and let me take this opportunity to wish you and uh, all those who are listening to this uh, program uh, uh, and Eid Mubarak. Excellency, thank you very much. Stay safe. We need you here in Cairo as a good friend of Egypt and as a great ambassador and a really experienced ex ambassador here in Egypt, Dr. Peter Kivik, uh, His Excellency, the ambassador of uh, Hungary in Egypt. My name is Dr. Amr Abruk and Dr. Mohammed was at the control. We'll see you next week, same time, same station, and have a safe weekend and a safe Eid.